So I'm Caroline, I do Renewable Energy Engineering at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. I'm Drew Barron, I study Mechanical Engineering at Penn State. My name is Eddie Anbra, I study uh, Chemical Engineering at Monash University of Australia. My name is Clay Moyer, I study Material Sciences at Penn State. And my name is Kyle Gliden, and I study Mechanical Engineering at Penn State. Lovely. And so together we are Is the Runga, we are Fuel for the Future. And so just to start us off, we want to just look at Icelandic energy usage and why we're sort of here presenting today. So Iceland, as we all know, has a 90% renewable energy usage, and that 10% left over is from fuel consumption in the transport industry. And so uh, Iceland uh, has increasing transport needs, particularly through tourism and fisheries, and it's also uh, a nation which has the highest diesel price in the European Union. So this expenditure is going to continue to increase as more tax is placed on diesel continually. So that's why we're going to look at biofuel. So who are we? I mean, we're all looking very dapper today, as you can see. Uh, we are Istaronga, uh, which means Iceland algae. We are the fuel for the future. Together we create biodiesel from uh, Dunelia salina algae creating a renewable and sustainable transport fuel. So that is our objective, and this is what we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, so what is Dunelia salina? It took me so long to learn this name, can I just say? Uh, so it's a green microalgae that is found in sea salt fields. Uh, here is a little picture of a drum containing it. It undergoes autotrophic photosynthesis, where it fixes CO2 with sunlight. So it allows us to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere. It thrives in high salinity broths, it really loves it, uh, and it has no cellulose cell wall, so it makes it even easier for us to disrupt the cell and remove lipids from inside. So how do we do it? Great question. Um, so there's three steps to uh, our process that we've built today. So the first one is the upstream processing of algae to replicate it. We want to create a lot of it. Our next step is we then harvest it using downstream processing to produce all the oils that we're after. Uh, and finally, we use transesterification to pr produce biodiesel uh, as well as glycerol. So in step one, this is the upstream process. We're going to keep this kind of short so we don't bore you all. Uh, but the algae is placed in a 0.3 meter deep uh, open raceway pond. So think of basically a massive pool with a, a, just basically a block of concrete in the middle. So it's going around in circles with some paddles moving it around. We then put greenhouses on top of this because we all know how cold Iceland can be. Uh, and then we use geothermal flue gas, which contains CO2. Uh, we put gas barges underneath and we allow that to feed into the pond and it allows the algae to grow and reproduce. We also use seawater in the broth due to the high salinity requirements of our algae. Uh, and UV and visible lights are used for the photosynthesis. We know how dark it can get in Iceland during winter. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. Um, you can see there the whole paddle wheel. I you see the sparges pushing the CO2 through. The geothermal flue gas is really good because it's actually quite hot when it comes out. So we can use a heat exchanger uh, and put about 20 degrees worth of heat through there to keep our algae growing. And here is really a quick video kind of showing what this looks like on a small scale. Uh, as you can see, paddle wheel is going, there's gas sparges underneath, and it's just pushing uh, the algae broth around in a circle. I know, high quality video. <laughs> awesome. So this is what it looks like with the greenhouse built over the top. This has actually been done already in a few places in the world to create spirulina. I don't know if anyone's ever had that before. They make little tablets out of it. So that's what they do uh, over in Scandin other parts of Scandinavia. And then we move to the downstream processing. So that's where we remove the water. Uh, we use this to do this during using flocculation. Some of you may have heard of it before, but we'll be using aluminium sulfate as a salt. We can get this from the aluminium smelter in Iceland, so it makes sense for us to use this. We then use centrifugation to thicken the slurry, uh, dehydrate it using uh, the sun, so we'd be putting it all in another warehouse to dehydrate our algae, and then we extract it via a screw press or a bead mill. Do you guys remember yesterday? That was just a screw press, so we'll be using the same kind of thing. Um, and then this will allow further separation. So again, I've got a little video here, and this kind of shows, uh, this is actually an algae, it's not our algae, but it's a different form and they built a screw press around it, and as you can see, we have our meal coming out the right-hand side, as we did yesterday, and our oil coming out the side here. Um, our algae has very high oil content, almost 40%, so it's much better than rapeseed. And you can actually see it collecting uh, and building there. There we go. 
Moving on, so our last one is the transesterification to biodiesel. Uh, for anyone who's made biodiesel before, you know that we need uh, either a methanol, an ethanol, or a propanol. We'll be using propanol, uh, and we'll also be using sodium nitrate to remove the soaps that can happen afterwards, which cause impurities to occur. We blend with regular diesel, so 20% biodiesel, 80% regular, and this can run fine in regular diesel car engines or bus engines without any issues. Uh, fishing ships, however, can run on 100% biodiesel, so we're taking a, a massive amount of weight on the shoulders of fishermen. And a small amount of propanol will be added as well in the blends to ensure engines start in a cold climate. So what do we need? Uh, to start off looking at from the infrastructure point of view, we're going to need five greenhouses, each uh, 30 by 300. That'll give us about an acre of total. Uh, we'll need one warehouse for drying, as Eddie had already mentioned, and one warehouse for machinery processes. Uh, we'll also need the open ponds and the paddle wheels for the uh, upstream processes. For miscellaneous production needs, we're going to need the aluminum smelter flue gas. We're going to need geothermal plant power and the propanol. We'll also need seawater and wastewater that we'll be using for the broth in the open pond. For the processing perspective, we're going to need the oil press and the screw press, as Eddie already mentioned. We'll need two centrifuges, which will be used to separate it. Uh, sodium nitrate catalyst, as well as four 200 liter drum reactors. Who will help? Uh, so the Lands Banky grant is a grant issued from Lands Banky that is for innovative startups, which we are eligible for. It will offer about 2,000 to 4,000 US dollars. Um, some partners that we will target. First on the list is Visvang Orca, which is actually based in Iceland. Uh, they are currently, they're a clean tech company. Currently they're researching the best areas in Iceland that are suitable for algae cultivation. So it's perfect for us. Uh, we'll also look at Shell and Lind Group. Uh, Shell actually is the number one investor in biodiesel and biofuel. Uh, also about this event, Orca, they have found that the most promising area in Iceland is the, uh, rec the Recane Peninsula, which is located where the Blue Lagoon is, which we all all been to, we know, which is perfect for us because we want to base our operations around the same area so we can access seawater as well as the geothermal plant. Lovely, and now we're all gone to who we help. And so there's a few different tiers of our industries of people we help. So governmental. We know that Iceland has a target to reach 40% renewables in the fuel industry by 2030, so we're helping them achieve that. And the energy agency is um, also promoting the reduction of high intensity use of fossil fuels in the transport industry as well. So we're, those two tiers of government, we're going to be helping out. Personally, the general Icelandic person will be able to reduce their fuel costs because we're going to have onshore processes. Uh, the amount, there's no tax on biofuels and the tax on diesel keeps increasing and that also is tax subsidies when you do use biofuels. And economically this is also really great for aluminium <coughs> smelters because we're helping to deal with their flue gas in a more economic way. Uh, it helps out basically tourism and transport industries as well because their fuel costs are going to decrease and, and then there's also the potential for export once the process can get larger. Now, so who are we going to reach, like how are we going to reach the general population? So we have an indirect means, which is through petrol stations. So you've got M1, Olives, and multiple other ones, which we can go out to. <laughs> I can't pronounce the other one's name. So we're, just gonna <laughs> so we're going to go out to them, and we're going to use them as a means to get to the general uh, population. There's also diesel distributors, which there's one in the north that supplies boats. It is pronounced Olu Graven, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and so that we're going to target them as well as a means of getting into the fishing industry and directly we are going to go to tourist <coughs> companies and bus companies like Greyline, Skybus and Breaker Big Excursions to try and become their exclusive fuel provider for biofuel. And so how we're interacting is we're kind of uh, using a backbone of a sustainable um, diesel as what we're marketing to, to petrol companies, saying that this is the future, you need a product where you're gonna be able to provide uh, biofuels, otherwise you're gonna go out of business as cars change and um, requirements and legislations change as well, as well as in industries. Ecotourism is an emerging industry, and so when consumers are looking at where they wanna go, which bus rides they wanna take, they're gonna go for the biofuel option if they can. So that's how we're gonna reach people. So now that we know exactly what we're going to be doing and who we're going to be doing it for and who we're reaching, 
We need to know the cost behind our entire company. So there are significant barriers to entry for this market, and that's due to the large construction costs for all our greenhouses and the implementation of heating and uh, lighting systems in those greenhouses. But with that being said, there's also government aid and very low operating costs. So once we have started up, it's going to be easy to sustain the company. And also Iceland in particular is a great place for us to locate our company because of the fact that they have abundant geothermal energy that we can use for heating, which is a huge cost saver, and also very cheap energy. So for the lighting, which is almost going to be constant during the winter, as we've seen, only four hours of sunlight. So, yeah. So these are our base costs before we include any of our additional revenue streams that we're going to be generating through our company. And as you can see, it's very expensive. It's $35 per gallon of biodiesel that we produce. And additionally, that'll be $335,000 for all five of our greenhouses. That's total, not each greenhouse. And then an additional $67,000 for our processing warehouses for the drying and the production of the actual biodiesel. And now these are the methods that we're gonna to use to offset these high costs. So the first would be grants, as Clay mentioned earlier, there are several grants that we would qualify for that we can hopefully get some aid for. And then there's also tax breaks and rebates. So as Caroline mentioned, we won't be taxed by uh, the government because um, it's green energy and uh, biofuels aren't taxed. And diesel companies will be, so that gives us a competitive advantage over them. But we'll also receive 20% of our spending on research and development back and 35% of startup costs back, is what I saw through the um, government taxing information. And then additional ways that we're gonna increase our revenue is by selling byproducts of our processing. And the two major byproducts we're gonna have is glycerol and the dry uh, meal that's produced when we withdraw the oil. So we're gonna sell the meal as livestock feed, which would offset the majority of our costs. And then the glycerol we intend to sell for cosmetic research, which they actually do at the Blue Lagoon. So if we end up settling on that as our location, we'll have a buyer directly next to us. And it's also a geothermal plant, so we should be able to utilize their geothermal energy for heating as well. And then all that combined brings our total down to $1.57 to $3.30 per gallon, which is almost one-tenth of what it was before. So based on our estimated production and current market prices, our net income for one year for biodiesel sales would be about $36,500. Uh, glycerol sales would add another almost $39,000. And the meal feed is where the largest uh, income comes from, and that's about $42,500 per year. And if you add them up and we take into consideration our yearly costs, which is mostly energy and heat, we would have a year yearly profit of about $93,000, which given our construction costs to build the warehouses and the greenhouses, we'd be looking at about four and a half years to break even, and then after that we would start um, actually getting profits. But this four and a half years doesn't consider any of the tax cuts or grants or any other investments that Clay and Kyle were talking about. So with those, the actual time to break even would be much lower. So our project, we felt as a group that it hit on a lot of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but especially the renewable energy, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. Brilliant, and so we've talked to you all about our idea today with Istronga, uh, but now we want to talk about the future and where we can move forward. So in the middle there you can see the raceway pond, that's what we're starting off on, uh, and goes to our biodiesel. However, there's a lot of room for us to make changes. Uh, there's something called a closed PBR, called a packed bed reactor. And these packed bed reactors are used for pharmaceutical companies to produce pharmaceuticals. Now, we can use those with our algae uh, to produce very high cost um, pharmaceuticals. So, we're looking at things like pigments, proteins, antioxidants, and omega-3. Uh, our algae choice itself produces beta carotene, which is actually quite expensive and a lot of people, a lot of companies want it. So we can open up uh, some closed pack bed reactor facilities to produce that. Because we're looking at being close to the Blue Lagoon, we're actually close to a town there. Uh, and so using wastewater is actually a good idea for us as well with our seawater to create a 50-50 broth. 
so we can actually help the town even further by taking some of their wastewater. Uh, the flue gas is up there as well, um, but one of the things we can produce down the bottom is biochar. So this is remnant biomass created via pyrolysis, so that's where you uh, do very high heats, but you don't allow oxidation to occur, and you create these pyrolyzed biochars. Now these are really good ways to sequester uh, CO2, and you can use those on agricultural crops, so the greenhouses nearby, uh, as well as using that for later and selling off to other companies. So in the future, I think we would like East Thoronga to follow something like this uh, and create a really full circle and renewable way of using transport fuels. Perfect, so here are our references. Um, thank you so much. Um, I know you mentioned this already, um, but could you briefly explain how you got the cost down from like $33 per gallon to like $2 per gallon? Yeah, so the major difference in those like pricing was um, the heating and electric because we are going to be using the geothermal heating, that's going to be very cheap. And we also, because we deal with the flue gas from companies, we would likely try to negotiate a deal with them where either like we get their gas, their like leftover from their geothermal reactions for no cost or like very minimal costs because of the fact that we're going to be dealing with their harmful flue gases for them. They don't have to worry about that treatment. So that would mitigate almost our entire like heat bill for that. And then also lighting, the prices will be lower. But the main contributors to it are the selling back the byproducts. So we can selling the dry product, this feed cuts it down a great amount, and then the glycerol on top of that, as you saw with Drew, the profitability, it's about like the same as the actual biodiesel. So we should be able to offset it by a ton. Um, you have the price of fuel being like one, three dollars. I'm not exactly sure. That was just through our research we found those values. Yeah, yeah just different research papers quoted different things. And uh, remember, we're only doing this on an acre, so we kind of thought a little bit small. Realistically, there's a lot of space in Iceland and a lot of room for us to build this. So we did well in the first few years. We could easily upgrade this to multiple acres and hopefully <coughs> cut that price even further. Really, for us, the more algae we can create, the better off we can do and the cheaper we can provide diesel. Um, can you use wastewater and still sell the pharmaceutical companies? Like, is it one or the other? Or do you, both? you can do both um, for open raceway, but remember, it's just before. So to do the other one, um, you want to use a pack bed reactor for the pharmaceutical <coughs> companies. And the reason is it's just more high quality. So when you use a pack bed reactor, you get a higher quality, higher efficiency of what you're after. Whereas open raceway, there's more chance of things like, yeah, like you're saying impurities and other things coming through. So that's fine for like a diesel. But that's not okay when you're going to be eating beta carotene. So, so like, it, it does matter or it doesn't? Sorry, what, what like was it? Like in having wastewater to grow those things, is that restricted or it is shouldn't. that fine? It shouldn't. It should be fine. It just depends on the reaction chamber. Yep. Are you selling your like algae oil to the diesel stations or are you like working together with them or are you buying diesel and then mixing it and then selling yeah. yourself? So there's different avenues we can go down, and I think it would majorly depend upon uh, what sort of a deal you can strike with the companies. Uh, particularly the company that sells to ships, they'd be a great one to sell to directly rather than mixing ourselves, because since they are a diesel manufacturing plant. But then if you're selling straight on to, say, tour companies, you'd want to import that diesel yourself and then mix it. And it is very easy to mix anyway, so it's not as if we need much infrastructure to do that. Realistically, we're playing off the wants and needs of Iceland to get that last 10% of renewable energy. So if we are, we're happy to provide to ships, but if they, they want this, then I think we would want them to blend it themselves because this is what they're after. They've been saying this for years. So as long as we may, we're able to negotiate, negotiate that with the Icelandic government, we assume that they would be able to do a lot of that blending themselves. Do you have an idea of like how many people it would take to run or operate um, these greenhouses? Would you need a large staff? Or yes, it's really minimal. minimal. So if you remember, we kind of looked at the tomato uh, place as a bit of a case study of how we could base our system, and they said that yeah, they could basically run it from a smartphone in a different place, and they don't need people there. And so we, yeah, in essence, have an extremely minimal team, and you wouldn't even need people at the site. We, yeah, we just have like so little, like so many things that would just they, they won't go wrong in comparison to, to other industries. So with the algae, we're literally just for weeks just going in a circle. So uh, we don't need that many people there to, to keep up on it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know that this is a, a, obviously a great alternative to fossil fuels, 
but I'm curious what kinds of emissions are associated with That's a good question. Um, from the, the papers that we've gone through and the research we've done, uh, it actually is, they show that it's a much more sustainable fuel as you sequester carbon dioxide and you produce it when you burn it afterwards. So it's almost like negated. Um, in terms of impurities, by the end of like the centrifuging and all the downstream processes, you generally just have the pure oils afterwards and you can actually go through further centrifuging to get that even more pure. So by the end of the process, the impurities wise, there shouldn't be anything in the biodiesel that's impure because it leaves with glycerol content. So what you've got left over is gonna be burning pretty much completely. So you should just get carbon dioxide and water as the, the end results. Now the reason we have biochar in there is what a lot of businesses are doing and they're taking 20% of their load and turning it into biochar and giving it to agricultural places because, because that sequesters it even more. There's even more carbon dioxide put in the soil and then they don't burn that. So it almost like off, like outbalances it, so you're actually becoming net positive on, on like removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that's the recommended one, 20% uh, uh, by chart. Jacob. My question was, what is the impact of the biochar on the soil? At the beginning, your costs were really high per gallon, mm. like thirty-five dollars. <coughs> yeah, which would bring it to like over a thousand dollars for like a barrel, yeah. or a dill barrel of oil. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, it really runs itself once it's been constructed. So it was a it was a small scale. Yeah, so we worked on one acre. I don't know if we should have put that in now. It was really just a comparison to show yeah. you what it was beforehand, what it was after. Yeah. So I would assume your price would go down as you expanded your process. That's exactly it. So it's almost um, exponential in growth because you continue to get large margins and you're able to produce more, but the cost is like it stays the same for the production of other things and it's low maintenance, so you can make quite a bit. The cost is free. Yeah.